Chapter 6 Water Tunnel In the 1950s, the popularity of bananas and pineapples created entire economies in South America supported by U.S. demand. Corporations paid pennies in land, labor, and export taxes to ensure profits stayed high in American-based companies. In 1953, democratically elected President Jacobo Arbenz of Guatemala started to renegotiate all existing Banana Republic contracts. Upset at the loss of profits, the United Fruit Company hired propaganda master Edward Bernays. He commissioned several op-ed articles in newspapers and magazines that convinced the American public that Guatemala was at risk of communist subversion. Under pressure from the American people, the CIA overthrew President Jacobo Arbenz and established a puppet government to ensure land, labor, and export taxes stayed low for the Banana Republic. William Stevenson, The Nature of Skyfall Events Boaz Island, part of the Bahamas, 1988 Rain poured down through the holes in the ceiling. It wove through cracks left by harsh winds that had failed to become hurricanes, then puddled on the floor. The entire house smelled of molding carpet and burning gas as multiple generators hummed around the clock. Avoiding standard electricity had been Silas's idea. The high grid demand and bills would draw attention. Alvera remembered the sound of wind, rain, and banana leaves, but now there was only the rattling hum of the machines. They spit gray-black smoke into the air. He'd lost the ability to separate the sound and smell from each other. Every time someone lit up around him, his ears started to ring out of habit. Putrid water pressed up through the carpet and onto the edge of his sandals as he walked through the house. Most of the workers slept inside the building to save on living costs. They'd taken the sand from the tunnel and built it up over the carpet for their beds. A torn pair of jeans hung from nearly every door. Tattered shirts were slung out windows to dry. The men seemed to wear as little clothing as possible. Alvaro imagined it was the heat but then he'd asked one of them about it once. Kevin explained that the less he wore clothes, the less he had to wash them, and the longer they lasted, the longer they looked new. Alvero looked at the mostly naked bodies of the men sleeping on their beds of sand. It wasn't about comfort. It was about poverty. Silas had promised that Skyfall would open the door to end poverty. If we can extract prejudice from humanity as Silas promised. Surely we can extract greed as well. In the kitchen floor was a large square-cut hole, the tunnel. Tubes and cord disappeared into the blackness. Alvero braced himself on the tile floor and stepped down the ladder. The corridor hummed with the sounds of water pumps. Metal sheets lined the walls, ground, and ceiling. Sand sifted in from the corners. Men crawled along, dodging the support beams as they carried buckets of sand and water. The floor sloshed with a muddy slop. Alvaro cupped his hand in the murk around his ankles. He held it out to one of the workers. How long will it last? The shirtless man shrugged. I've never heard of anyone building a tunnel on an island. Who's to say? Alvaro dropped the sand and cleaned his hands on his clothes. Figured it out. He waddled toward the ladder, his head ducked low, and his skin glossy like everyone else in the tunnel. Sweat dripped down his face. He felt a finger tap him on the shoulder. Boss? A boy in his mid-teens, with thin, gangly arms and legs, knelt with his head bowed. He spoke in broken English. Boss? We lose job soon? The question gave Alvaro pause. He tilted his head and frowned. The islanders had learned to expect construction projects to end abruptly and unfinished. Likely, this boy had never had a stable job in his life. Likely, he wasn't even literate. Likely, he was using the house above to sleep at night along with the others. Alvaro put his hand on the boy's shoulder. 
Money is not our problem. He ran a finger along the edge where two metal sheets met. The sand dribbled down. Keep my tunnel working, and you will have a job. Yes, boss. Gangly disappeared into the unlit section. Alvero reached the ladder and made his way into the house. From the window, he could see Stevenson's estate. They would hit the mark beneath the mansion on schedule, but there were always problems. The whole purpose was simple, to plant cameras and microphones so they could study him and his coding system. The easiest approach would have been to bribe his employees, but Stevenson had more money than God. In the 1930s, he and a colleague developed technology that allows images to be transmitted by radio waves. Once television was invented, any time someone wanted to broadcast something over TV, Stevenson got a cut. But the old spy would never suspect a tunnel on Boaz Island. No one would, and there was a reason for that. It was as unstable as jello nailed to a wall. Alvero checked his watch. His regular bar appointment would start soon. He stripped his clothes and wiped his body down with a rag before dressing in something new and dry, then headed out. At the tavern, he checked to make sure Miguel was seated in the corner recording everything. Alvero knew his own ideas about the world were strange, but he'd learned that no one took him seriously if he were slobbering drunk. Sometimes he couldn't remember everything. That's why he needed the event recorded. The windows were open, allowing the sea breeze to flush out most of the smells. Important, particularly since many of the inhabitants of this city didn't wear deodorant. It wasn't a European thing or health decision. Again, most of these people's decisions were governed by poverty. Alvero gestured to the bartender. Vodka, the whole bottle. A blue rubber band constricted around the base of the bottle to indicate that it was mostly water, but Alvero still needed to look and smell inebriated. At a center table, three loud Americans scrunched their faces and daggered their eyes at people they thought were producing the wretched scent. You think they don't know what they smell like? <laughs> you arrogant bastards. He wasn't drunk enough to say it out loud. He worked his way down the neck and shoulders of the bottle, keeping a close watch on the mirror behind the bar for his eyes to take on that hazy red appearance. In his mind, Alvero reviewed his rant. The ideas never changed, just the wording. That was the reaction he was looking for, how they would take his words. What sugarcoating made them easiest to swallow? His eyes turned bloodshot and he could hear the slobber in his own speech after a time. He scanned the room and then wobbled over to the American's table. He brought with him a fresh bottle of vodka to share. The Romans, he declared, sinking into the seat and pushing the new bottle to the center of the table. You know the Romans, eh? He held up his index finger. He made eye contact with each individual, speaking only a single word at a time. You are the Romans. A heavy man with dark black hair curling out from edges of his shirt chuckled. I've been to Rome. Alvero pointed an unsteady finger at the man. But do you know the Roman peace? A burp jiggled his body. Roman conquered the world with fire and the sword. He stamped his finger on the table, leaving behind it ash and blood. That's what Roman called peace. The blonde woman leaned in to whisper something to the man with curly black hair. He must be some professor or something to be this drunk and still want to talk like that. American is the new Rome. Alvaro slumped down onto the table, half an act and half to steady himself. Curly chuckled. Someone better get him home soon. You conquer. Alvero's fingers fumbled for his shot glass, with movies, music, and the promise of a better life. He tried to pour himself another glass, and a pair of hands stopped him. You've had enough, Curly said. But what do you leave behind? Alvero swatted at the interfering hands. Greed, materialism, disloyalty to everything except the almighty dollar. 
He staggered to his feet, fumbled for his wallet, and produced a single dollar bill. And you call it capitalism. Alvaro pretended to collapse in a stupor. But Rome fell. He looked up, his face still flat against the table. Do you know that story? A voice came from somewhere nearby. Just leave him. Alvaro could hear them leaving. He wanted to turn and face them, but simply laid still, feeling the cool wood against his face. Was it his drunkenness that drove them away, or his ideas? Nero, he called out, trying to convince them to stay, corrupted their currency. If they heard him, they didn't care. After a while, the sounds of people laughing, ordering, and the clap of glass against wood died down. The alcohol worked its way out of his blood. Miguel sat down, and his tall body made the chair look like it was built for a child. He placed a large mug of water on the table. Drink this. Alvaro rolled back until he was sitting up again. He groaned and took a few gulps. We should start tracking what I drink. How much? So this doesn't happen again. Miguel nodded. His chiseled jaw and fine features seemed pulled from a movie screen. He could never blend in. His Chilean royal blood had been saturated by beautiful people marrying into his family for nearly two hundred years. I haven't heard this one before, about Rome. Is that really how it fell? No. Alvera looked around the bar for a clock. There wasn't one. He leaned forward, his head swelling and throbbing, as he checked his watch. The actual fall of Rome was a gradual process that took over a century. But, he took a sip of water, what Nero did nearly ended the empire in a single year. Manipulating the currency caused three Roman generals to march on the capital and war with each other. Rome didn't fall that day, but it came very close. What's this got to do with the Americans? Miguel shut the camera off and packed it away. Rome was the greatest empire the world has ever known. Alvera rose and exited the bar. They conquered everything they set their eyes on for the sole purpose of the glory of Rome. America is much the same. Instead of incorporating their underlings, they set up puppet governments and enact unfair treaties, create instability and war for no other purpose than to keep the cost of their living down. Miguel shook his head. The U.S. loaned our country millions of dollars. They said it was to help our infrastructure, schools, and economy. In exchange, they required we privatize our oil fields. He stopped walking and hung his head. Those same fields were bought by American businesses only days after they were privatized. When the British colonized the world, they were clear in their exploitation. They didn't try to hide it. But America calls it a fair market. Exactly. Alvaro thrust his finger at his colleague. Nero failed to destroy Rome because too many people still trusted in the currency, still used it. When I have Skyfall, I won't change the dollar, just what people believe about it. Then Rome will fall. Miguel put a hand on his friend's shoulder. I hope I'm there to see it. Alvaro nodded. Let's get back to building that tunnel. The roll of ocean waves sounded around them. Only one street lamp on the entire boulevard worked. They walked by moonlight. A hulking drunk staggered towards them, his shoulders nearly as wide as the sidewalk. He crashed into Alvaro, dropping his bottle to the ground. Hey, pay attention, the man bent down, groping for the alcohol. His accent was distinctly American. Ignore him. Alvaro waved dismissively. Then he was shoved from behind. You treat me like that, the drunk stumbled. You better watch your back. Alvaro froze. His muscles went rigid. He turned slowly. No. The man slurred his words. What? I don't want to watch my back. Let's settle it now. 
Alvaro raised his arms to a fighting position. The drunk wavered. What the hell's wrong with you? It's just an expression. Not where I come from. Alvaro raised his arms higher, intentionally leaving his stomach wide open, making it appear he didn't know how to fight. You threaten me? I believe you. Now let's end it. I'll put you in a hospital. The drunk smirked and took a fighting stance. Bitch. Alvaro waited for the man to take the first swing. It went as planned. The drunk swung low towards the exposed abdomen. He connected, leaving his face wide open. Alvaro lashed out, jabbing his thumb into the man's eye. The eyeball shifted to one side, and the man cried out. The thrust continued. It forced the eye out of the socket, and it dangled down on his face. The optic nerve kept it from detaching completely. The thrust continued until Alvaro dug into the man's brain, and his body went limp. On the ground, the dead body leaked blood and brain onto the still dangling eyeball. Miguel covered his mouth with his hand. Oh, God, that's disgusting! Alvaro wiped his finger on the dead man's shirt. Sacrifice. Eat something few people truly understand. He thought I was unskilled at fighting, because that conclusion made more sense in his head than the truth that I would intentionally let him hit me. Alvaro had made similar gambits with Jones and Silas. For one, he pretended to be incompetent and foolhardy, while he was obedient and agreeable with the other. Both of them had bought his sacrifice. What do we do with the body? Alvaro looked down at the man. Nothing. When they find a dead American here, fewer of them will come to visit. He snapped his fingers. Come, we have a tunnel to build. 